Hey guys, today we're going to talk about chapter three, prokaryotic cell morphology, structure, and function. All right, so here's a typical prokaryotic cell. The right side is what you might see on a transmission electron micrograph of the surface. And then the left side is a model or an artist rendering of what the interior structures of a prokaryotic cell might look like. So we've got ribosomes, those tiny little red dots. Cytoplasm is, of course, the fluid that fills the cell. The nucleoid with the genetic material. And then the outer covering of the cell, the glycocalyx, the cell wall, the cytoplasmic membrane. And we even see a flagellum there for motility. So cell membrane or cytoplasmic membrane, these are synonyms. The structure is composed of two layers or leaflets of phospholipid molecules. Now a phospholipid is a molecule that has two parts to it. There's a head that's hydrophilic, so it likes water, and a tail that's hydrophobic or water-fearing. And these will orient themselves so that the hydrophobic tails face each other in the two layers and the hydrophilic heads face the outside or the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell cavity. Because remember, the cytoplasm and usually the environment where bacteria are found are all water-based, right? So the hydrophilic side should be facing the water and the hydrophobic tails face each other. There are also various proteins that are inserted into this phospholipid bilayer. <clears throat> So the fluid mosaic model describes our current understanding of membrane structure. And it looks something like this. So you see all those blue hydrophilic heads and the yellow hydrophobic tails on those phospholipid molecules and how they've oriented themselves so all the tails face inside together away from the water. There's water in the cytoplasm inside the cell, and also the environment where the cells live are mostly water. All right, and then you also see some of those integral proteins pictured here in purple. Some are anchored on one side of the membrane or the other, but there are also some proteins that cross both layers of the membrane. All right. Now, the cell membrane isn't rigid. It's called the fluid mosaic model. So I kind of picture it like a whole bunch of beach balls floating in a swimming pool. If there's a wave, right, if somebody jumps in, it's going to make all those other balls bounce around and move and shift. And that's how the cell is able to be flexible. <clears throat> the functions of the cell membrane are a few. So it's a site for energy generation. The electron transport system, if they have one, you would find in the cell membrane. It's also a permeable barrier. So it contains the contents of the cell, and it's selectively permeable. Some molecules can move through freely. Others require a transport protein to transport nutrients against the concentration gradient. And this, of course, requires the use of energy. All right, inside the cell, is filled with cytoplasm. So it's a viscous aqueous liquid enclosed by the cell, water-based. And most of the biochemical and biological functions necessary to maintain life happen in the cytoplasm. The DNA is a single circular chromosome which is located in the nucleoid region. There is no membrane in a prokaryotic cell nucleus, so we call it a nucleoid. It also contains plasmids. Plasmids are extra chromosomal elements. They're small circular molecules, and these are genes that are not essential for normal growth, but they often carry antibiotic resistance genes. Ribosomes are involved in protein synthesis, and these serve as structures that facilitate the joining of amino acids which form peptides or proteins. Each ribosome is made up of a large and a small subunit. 
and it's indicated by an S, which reflects how fast they settle when they're spun at very high speeds. The faster they move down towards the bottom in a centrifuge, the higher the S value, and so the greater their density. So we can classify prokaryotic ribosomes based on their density here. Prokaryotic ribosomes are usually at 70S. They're composed of a 30S and a 50S, and they don't have to add up to 70. Eukaryotic ribosomes are larger. They're 80S ribosomes. <clears throat> so we can tell the difference or tell what kind of cell a ribosome came from just by examining its density. Now, the origins of mitochondria and chloroplasts are fascinating. We call this the endosymbiont theory. And this is the theory that ancestors of mitochondria and chloroplasts were once bacteria residing within other cells, sharing a beneficial partnership. So mitochondria, you know, the powerhouse of eukaryotic cells, is the site of the electron transport system. It's where cell respiration happens. Chloroplasts are the photosynthetic structures in plant cells. So they used to be free-living prokaryotes, but they were engulfed by a eukaryotic cell. And instead of being digested, they developed a symbiotic relationship in which both the mitochondria or the chloroplast and its eukaryotic host benefit. Evidence to support this theory is that they have genes that make 70S ribosomes. Remember, eukaryotic cells all have 80S ribosomes. So the ribosomes in chloroplast and mitochondria are prokaryotic ribosomes. DNA comparisons have shown close relationships to a group of obligate intracellular parasites. They elongate and divide similar to bacteria, and they have a double membrane like their own regular prokaryotic membrane, but then also the eukaryotic membrane they would have picked up on their way into the original cells. You can learn more about the endosymbiotic theory by watching this YouTube video, but it's fascinating. Some bacteria also have inclusions. These inclusions might be things like granules of starch or glycogen, sulfur, or even magnetic particles. Some have gas vesicles for buoyancy. These granules contain polyhydroxybutyrate, and it's something that's used to make biodegradable plastics. Now, Bacteria also have cell walls outside of their cell membranes. There are two major different types of cell walls we'll discuss here today. Gram-positive bacterial cell walls are the first. They have a relatively thick layer of peptidoglycan, and they contain tachoic acids, which aid in the passage of ions. Lipotechoic acids anchor the cell wall to the cell membrane and they appear purple in a gram stain procedure. Up to 60%, they're made up of 60% mycolic acid in acid fast genera, and it helps the cells survive desiccation so they don't dry out. Now, peptidoglycan is a linear polymer of alternating subunits of N-acetylglucosamine, or NAG, and N-acetylmuramic acid, or NAM. And these act as chainmail armor that completely encloses the cell. So there are crosslinks between these polysaccharide chains, which make a chain mail of peptidoglycan, and it protects the cell from osmotic forces. So too much or too little water. So you should be familiar with the structure of peptidoglycan. You should know that it's made of alternating units of NAM and NAG. 
And it's very important that you know that those alternating units also have cross links and they add strength. So it's just like a chainmail armor for a bacteria. And these structures for NAG and NAM are very similar chemically to glucose. So if you look on the left here, glucose is this ring structure and it's the same basic ring structure that we see NAG and NAM having. So if you look here and got the same hydroxyl group and H here that's in glucose in NAG, what changes is this group here. The hydroxyl and the glucose is replaced with this glucosamine. And then for NAM, we take this N acetyl glucosamine molecule and change out the hydroxyl group from your amic acid part. So they're very similar to glucose and they alternate in this fashion NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, and so on. All right, and if we were to look at the cell wall of a gram positive bacteria, so like if we were to cut out a slice here and look at it closely there's a very thick peptidoglycan cell wall layer and you see that here underneath that or medial to that would be the cell membrane so this is where we have those phospholipids with their hydrophilic heads and blue and the yellow hydrophobic tails they're the pink integral proteins down here of the cell membrane and then on the outside of that is where you find the peptidoglycan cell wall. Good. All right. And here's another model of the same thing. So we've got the peptidoglycan cell wall made up of those alternating NAG and NAM, yellow and blue hexagons. There are tachoic acids at the top. Remember, those help to bring in ions and the lipotechoic acids help to anchor the cell wall to the cell membrane. Remember the cell membrane is not part of the cell wall but they are connected by those lipotechoic acids. All right the second type of bacterial cell wall we're going to talk about today are gram negatives. Now these have three layers to them. There's an interior cytoplasmic membrane, just like we saw in gram-positive cells, a peptidoglycan layer, same order as what we saw before, except the peptidoglycan layer and gram-negative bacteria are very thin. And they also have an outer membrane. Now the outer membrane is a bilayer membrane outside the peptidoglycan. It contains phospholipids, proteins, and also lipopolysaccharides. It also contains porins. And that space around that thin layer of peptidoglycan between the two types of membrane is called periplasmic space. Gram-negative bacteria will appear pink following a gram stain compared with gram-positives that look purple. So we can tell who's who using this differential stain. Okay, so if we were to look at a cross-section of a gram-negative cell wall, we see here there's three layers. There's the outer membrane, which kind of has that salmon color on top. Those salmon colored, oops, there's these, how would you describe those? They almost look like coral. But these structures on top of that second membrane, these are the lipopolysaccharides. And then we see the hydrophobic tails and the phospholipid heads here of the bottom side of that outer membrane. It has these yellow porins that help things move through the membrane. Underneath that outer membrane, there's a very narrow or very thin layer of peptidoglycan. So they do have a cell wall, but it's very, very thin. And that gap between the two membranes here, this is the periplasmic space. Under the periplasmic space is the cell membrane. 
just like the membrane we saw in the last one. So there's your two layers of phospholipid heads that are hydrophilic and the hydrophobic tails in the center and the integral proteins here in purple. Now a gram negative cell wall, here's another model. We see uh, at the very bottom here, we've got our cell membrane with the phospholipid bilayer. Above that is a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. And we call this space from one membrane to the next, the periplasmic layer. And then the outer membrane is phospholipids on the inner leaflet. The outer leaflet is made up of those lipopolysaccharides. And this outer membrane also contains those porin proteins that help move things across the membrane. All right, so comparing gram-positive and gram-negative cells. A gram-positive cell wall has a very thick chainmail layer of peptidoglycan. We see that here. And the cytoplasmic membrane underneath that is the same as the cytoplasmic layer you'd see in a gram-negative cell. However, that's where the similarities end. The gram-negative cell has a very thin peptidoglycan cell wall. And on the outside of that peptidoglycan layer, there is an outer membrane with phospholipids and lipopolysaccharides. And this is where you also see those new porin proteins. So what difference does it make if a bacteria is gram-positive or gram-negative? Well, it makes a big difference for how you might treat an infection with these bacteria. Penicillin and penicillin derivatives disrupt the formation of peptidoglycan. A faulty peptidoglycan layer can cause a faulty cell wall, and faulty cell walls can rupture and cause the cell to die. So if you have a gram-positive infection, penicillins can be very effective. The outer membrane of gram-negative cell wall protects those gram-negative cells from the penicillin. So if you have an infection with gram-negative bacteria, treating with penicillin won't do you any good. Now, not all bacteria have cell walls. Here's mycoplasma, for example. Some cells, or some types of bacteria, have something different, like a glycocalyx or capsule. It's made of polysaccharide fibers, and what it is is a layer of mucoid material that surrounds the cell. And it helps to protect the bacterial cells from phagocytosis or being eaten and engulfed by like white blood cells. It also helps bacteria adhere to surfaces like plaque on your teeth. And it can protect the cell from desiccation or drying out. Some cells also have flagella. And flagella are used for motility or moving around. They're usually too thin to be seen with a light microscope without using a special stain. But you can see some examples here. All right, pili or fimbriae are some other extracellular structures. They're shorter and thinner than flagella, but usually also more numerous. They enable attachment to surfaces, including a host, and some are even sex pilus. So there are tubes that are able to transfer genetic material like plasmids from one cell to another. Here in this transmission electron micrograph, you can see a conjugation pilus or a sex pilus going from one cell to the other, and it would transfer plasmids from one cell to the other. Some other special bacterial cell structures are endospores and biofilms. Now, endosporms are resistant, dormant structures formed by some gram-positive bacteria. Cells that produce endospores do not have the spore at all times. It's just like an ability that they can use when they need to. 
So the cell exists as a vegetative cell or an actively growing cell. But a vegetative cell can undergo sporulation. It only takes about eight hours when conditions are poor. So this synthesized in response to a nutrient limitation or maybe high cell densities or other environmental factors. An endospore has no detectable metabolism. It doesn't require any energy. It's just waiting. Endospores can germinate or develop into a new vegetative cell when favorable conditions return. So the life cycle of an endospore might be a vegetative cell undergoes sporulation to form an endospore, and that endospore just waits for good conditions to return. And when they do, it will germinate and turn into a new vegetative cell. Endospores are long-term survival structures. They can wait for years or even centuries before germinating. They're resistant to extreme environmental conditions, so heat in an autoclave won't kill them. Chemicals won't kill them. They can't dry out and desiccate. Radiation doesn't affect them, and antibiotics also have no effect on an endospore. All right, another special structure of bacteria are biofilms. It's a community of a variety of microbes, both pro prokaryotic and often eukaryotic cells, which attach to solid surfaces and grow into masses. Biofilms grow on rocks, pipes, teeth, and medical implants. Here's an example of a scanning electron micrograph. This is a staphylococcus biofilm on a catheter. All right, and then I'd like to review just one more time cell morphology and arrangement. We talked about this in chapter two, but it wouldn't hurt to hear it again. So remember, we have to use a microscope to determine cell morphology. The three basic shapes are cocci, bacilli, and spiral. There are other shapes that are less common, like vibrio, coxobacillus, and pleomorphic. Here's a nice vi visual. And these cells can be arranged in special ways as well. So a string of cocci are streptococci. A pair of cocci are diplococci. Fours are called tetrads. Eights are sarsini and a large cluster are staphylococci. Bacilli can be single, diplo, you can have strings of streptobacilli, lined up side to side are palisade bacilli, and they can also be in V-shape arrangements. All right, so that's it for chapter three, guys, bacterial cell structure and function.